Welcome to this episode of Call to Account. Today, my colleague Paul Croft and I will discuss the recent judgment in the famous Dick Smith litigation. BRI Ferrier was engaged by the defendants to prepare a report into one aspect of that litigation, referred to in the judgment as the dividend case. In brief, the dividend case focused on whether the director's actions in approving and paying the 2015 financial year interim and final dividends resulted in a breach of the third clause of Section 254T of the Corporations Act, which states that a dividend cannot be paid if it materially prejudices the interests of creditors. Now, Paul was largely responsible for drafting BRI Ferrier's expert accountant reports in this matter and has very much been looking forward to the judgment as Section 254T of the Corps Act was previously untested in the courts. So, Paul, it seems to me that the judgment in the dividend case has ramifications for directors beyond just interpreting Section 254T. What are your initial thoughts about the judgment? Thanks, Jackie, and I think you're spot on. This case is significant because going into it, there was no precedent interpreting the concept of material prejudice in the context of Section 254T. From a forensic accounting perspective, the judgment establishes a framework for evaluating the impact of paying dividend on a creditor's interests, and it makes clear that, the, that where there is a breach of Section 254T, the measure of damages is the economic harm to the company, not the quantum of the dividend. And as to the point you make, Jackie, the judgment has some clear ramifications for directors, particularly CFOs, because one, it explains how directors' obligations to creditors under Section 254T operate in conjunction with their duties to the company under Section 180 and, as, and Section 588G of the Corporations Act. And two, it elaborates on the nature and the extent of the information directors may rely on when taking decisions about dividends to avoid or mitigate a breach of their obligations under Section 180 and 254T. So back to your first comment, what are the key findings regarding the court's conclusions about Section 254T? Look, ultimately, the court concluded that no breach of Section 254T C arose because the dividend payment either had no impact on creditors or did not materially worsen the position of the creditors through delayed payment. My three takeaways are this. Number one, the creditors relevant to Section 254T are those creditors, creditors existing or like to exist at the time of paying the dividend. This is because future creditors, those creditors, creditors who don't exist at the time of paying the dividends, are already protected by the insolvent trading provisions contained in Section 588G. Secondly, the court looked at whether the dividend actually caused the company to have a reduced ability to pay its creditors. Now, it said that that reduced ability includes not only a material risk that creditors will not be paid at all, but that also a material delay may occur in paying them when those debts fall due. And it said that this requires an assessment of and a comparison between the position prior to paying the dividend and after paying the dividend to determine whether creditors are in a worse position. And thirdly, during the course of our expert reports, there was debate between the experts about what due and payable meant. We put forward the argument that um, it was business practice that companies would defer some payments. And evidence was presented in court that showed that some 32% some of business payments were made beyond the stand 30-day term. So therefore, the court concluded for a breach of Section 254T to occur, the dividend payment must make the position of the deferred creditors materially worse, both in terms of the quantum and the period of delay. And when you're assessing that position, the extent to which deferrals were made with the creditor's acquiescence is quite important and may be taken into account. Now, as I recall, there was considerable disagreement between the accounting experts over what information constituted a reasonable basis to support the board's dividend declarations and payment. That's correct, Jackie. But before I respond, before I respond, I'll just give you a bit of context. The directors were provided with monthly board packs that include the types of information you'd expect to see from in public companies. You know, it had actual versus forecast, monthly trading analysis, monthly cash flow forecasts, forecasts, debt covenant analyses, and, and functional area updates. And at the time of taking the dividends, the, the board packs included 
the audited half a year or full year accounts, dividend papers, and ASX briefing packs. The plaintiff's expert concluded that the board packs were not reliable, and not just not reliable, but they didn't provide a reasonable basis for the directors to take the decisions to pay the dividends. And they didn't also explicitly consider the question of material prejudice in their decisions about the, di in their decisions about the dividends. They disagreed with the, plaintiff in, the plaintiff's expert in this regard, and, and the court's conclusions were directly consistent with those that we put forward in our reports. For directors, it's important to understand why the court found the board packs to be reliable and a reasonable basis for, paying, uh, for taking the decisions about the dividends. Firstly, the directors had no reason to doubt that the company's audited half-year position and full-year accounts did not present a true and fair view of the company's financial performance. Now, in circumstances where the company might be at risk of insolvency, um, then the directors might have cause to doubt that, 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 that view. Um, but as the judge pointed out in the case, that those circumstances weren't present. Secondly, the judge noted that vari variances often, can often occur in cash flow forecasts. But he really pointed out that it's the materiality of the discrepancies when taken as a whole, that is taken over the whole reporting period, and the board's understanding of the causes of those discrepancies and their responses thereto are relevant considerations when assessing the reliability of the cash flow forecasts. And, and thirdly, in circumstances where the payment of a dividend may cause or may risk uh, material prejudice to creditors, Strategies designed to mitigate that risk, such as those that were implemented by the company to reduce overstocking and pay down creditors, can be implemented concurrently with the decision to pay a dividend. So, Paul, one of the contentious issues central to the plaintiff's case was that the daily cash flows ought to have been provided to the directors. And had they been provided, the directors would have been aware that paying the dividend would have caused the company to breach its debt facility limits. What did the court have to say about that? Firstly, the court concurred with our view that the daily cash flows used for managing a company's daily or weekly creditor payments are not relevant to the board, notwithstanding that the daily cash flows may highlight peak debt and show pinch points. This is because boards are interested in changes of debt over time and whether the company remains within its debt facility limits notwithstanding that you know, one-off sporadic daily facility breaches may occur with the knowledge and permission of the facility provider. What is important to directors is whether the company is forecast to remain within its debt facility limit at the, project, at the projected payment, dividend payment date. But the CFO was not so lucky, and let, let me explain why. Now, the daily cash flows prepared at the time of the final board meeting approving the uh, final dividend showed that the company was likely to breach its debt facility limit by paying the dividend. Now reasonably, the court found that the CFO uh, likely reviewed those daily cash flows, was aware of or ought to have been aware of those daily cash flows. Accordingly, the court concluded the CFO breached his duty under Section 180 because the final dividend payment he prepared did not set out the rationale behind his conclusion that the interests of the creditors would not be materially prejudiced by paying the dividend, which he knew was forecast to cause the company to exceed its debt facility limits. Paul, what are the key takeaways for forensic accountants, and by extension they're instructing lawyers, tasked with providing expert evidence? Now, the plaintiff's expert relied on lay evidence prepared by a company employee, setting out a monthly analysis of the value and number of deferred creditors um, over, a month, over a period of months. Despite there being some very obvious flaws in that evidence, including the fact that it did not take account of the deferrals, uh, deferred payments that were allowed by creditors, the plaintiff's expert failed to make proper adjustment to that evidence. And then while the company operated on a financial month end, the plaintiff's expert decided to recast the company's month end creditors to a calendar end basis. Um, so they could conclude that schedule of deferred creditors, the flawed schedule, as a basis for arguing that the dividend payment caused the company to breach its debt facility limits. Consequently, the court found that it was difficult to rely on the experts' conclusions, concluding that the value of this analysis is seriously undermined by the way in which Mr Dougal seeks to identify overdue creditors. That's all for this episode, folks. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.